everyone. Uh, welcome to our webinar. This is Nathan Wozniak, founder and CEO of Ubiquity LLC. Today we are having a webinar for two hours and it's called Handling Cryptocurrency Transaction in Real Estate. We have 31 people who have RSVP'd, which is fantastic. Um, as I mentioned, Nathan Wozniak, founder and CEO of Ubiquity. Uh, we're the leading uh, enterprise blockchain company for real estate title uh, and escrow, one block at a time our trademark. Uh, you can learn more about us at ubiquity.io and our event website for anyone you want to send a quick link to, you know, we have a couple, we have a couple hours here. Uh, you can just send them to ubiquity.net um, or send them the direct crowd cast link. Um, so a little bit of background to ubiquity. We were founded almost seven years ago, September 15th, 2015. Uh, we're registered in Wellington, Delaware with staff and advisory and partners uh, located worldwide. So we have staff in South America, Germany, um, myself in Toronto, Canada, and we have shareholders, member owners, I guess we call them as an LLC, all across the US and even some in Hong Kong. So um, we're pioneers in blockchain and, and title, experienced professionals with a proven track record and a clear focus on our clients' needs. So our focus is on, um, used to be small business, but now it's medium enterprise. Title companies, uh, one of our, uh, our largest clients and exclusive partners is Rainier Title. Uh, Rainier was recently acquired uh, last fall by Stewart Title, the number four in title insurance underwriter in the US. And they're a great exclusive partner for the next couple of years and we're doing a lot of good work with them. We work with, we have worked with escrow companies, we work with title companies um, who, and actually the, one of the largest title companies for aviation um, in the U.S. called AIC Title, and um, we are always working on, on relationships across the world. You'll actually hear from a gentleman named Santiago Morfren, who is a, an affiliate. He, he works in Latin America, and uh, he's really helping us from a business development perspective there. So um, what does Ubiquity offer? Uh, an API, uh, a, a blockchain as a service platform. We actually, op we actually recently open sourced uh, our unanimity code base, and we also have a hosted cloud solution. Um, we have been working on smart escrow, but we're modulizing it now. So really we'll be starting off with building modules for the title um, escrow login, um, uh, banking sector, as well as underwriters. And we'll be building that slowly and then a pragmatic approach. And then what we'll do is we'll be um, adding them as an interoperable, uh, that's a good word with seven syllables, I believe. Interoperable integration into Ubiquity Pay. So, um, like I mentioned, Ubiquity Pay is the you know Ubiquity Pay basically is our new focus, uh, our, our our primary focus as a company. But uh, we're also building module add-ons to make everything interoperable. So, a brief summary of the title industry. Uh, the, you know, in, in a couple of years, I don't have the latest stats. This is a bit old stats. It's 2020, $16.4 billion market. Uh, title insurance uh, had grown by 1.3% a little over a year ago and about 3% since 2015 to 2020. Uh, so we are working on quite a lot of stuff. You know, take a look at uh, ubiquitypay.com. It's our payment gateway. We are working with a, a couple of different payment providers. In fact, you'll, you'll, you'll get to hear from Peter Jensen, who is the CEO of Rocket Fuel Blockchain Inc. They're one of our payment providers, our main payment provider, allowing us to connect over 100 cryptocurrencies through our platform, uh, including through our crypto listing service. So let me just skip right ahead to the bottom of my lines here. A few disclaimers, okay? So this is important. Um, it is, okay, please remember this event is being recorded. So please be keep it professional at all times. Uh, Ubiquity staff may mention how we're fundraising. So as a disclaimer for that, not an offer to sell securities. Uh, information contained in this webinar is not an offer to sell securities or the solicitation of an offer to buy securities, nor shall there be any sales securities in any jurisdiction which such offer, solicitation, or sale would be unlawful prior to registration or qualification under securities laws in such a jurisdiction. Um, you can learn more at uh, ubiquity.io and um, we are doing fundraising at wefunder.com slash ubiquity be sure to also read the disclaimer so remember one more thing the views expressed in this webinar are not necessarily those of ubiquity so each speaker has 15 minutes five minutes q a and up first is rex perry with his 
speech, Hernando de Soto, digitizing the informal economy. So I'm going to mute myself now, and you have the floor, sir. All right, great. And I'm going to hit my timer so I don't go over time. I was in radio for 20 years, so I know how important it is to hit the, the cue marks so that you can do the commercials at the right time. Uh, my background real quickly, I'm a fifth generation native of Arizona. Uh, my great great grandfather was sent by Brigham Young to settle Arizona and he ended up getting killed in a gunfight, which is another very interesting story. He was not fighting. He was trying to stop the fighting and he was the only casualty. That's another story. But I got history here in Arizona. My background actually started in title insurance. Uh, and I became a licensed title officer in Utah, uh, where we used abstract books back in the 70s. And anyway, it was way before everybody's time. I know that. But uh, this understanding of ownership and title has always been a very important land rights and security that comes through ownership and uh, allowing or keeping people from trespassing on your property. And this is part of the history. I'm a little bit of a history buff. So. I had a, always interest in real estate. If anyone reads my resume, I've been doing real estate for years. We used to go down in the 80s to Mexico, down to San Carlos at a timeshare. And I'm a general contractor, real estate guy. I would cross the border and see this beautiful country. And I always ask myself, how come the country in Mexico is not managed better? So I started working on a book called uh, Why Mexico Looks Like Mexico and Canada looks like Canada. And I happen to be watching PBS Channel 8 in Arizona. It's a public television. And there was this brief documentary where a guy was talking to some elderly gentleman in Africa. And he was asking the African gentleman, how, you know, this is your home. And he was showing pictures of the hut and everything. He says, how do you know that it's your home? And the guy says, it's my home because this is where I live. And everybody in the village knows this is where I live. And he says, so if you get up and leave the village, how do people still know that it's your home? And he says, if I get up and leave the village, it's no longer my home. And this individual turned out to be Hernando de Soto. I didn't know it at the time because I didn't get a chance to finish watching the documentary. And it's back way before uh, you, could, uh, uh, you could record things. And I just wasn't ready for it. But it hit me that, uh, and we were traveling down to Mexico right at the same time as I'd seen this, that it was this understanding. So uh, I started researching Hernando de Soto and found different articles, and he's written some great books. Anybody, I'm now a, a de Soto disciple, but he wrote a book, a couple of books. One is called uh, uh, A New Path or a Different Path, which was fighting the communists in Peru. His story is quite interesting, oh, and Mystery of Capital is the other really important one. But his story is that his father was driven out of Peru in the 50s and 60s because of political strife and his, what his father was trying to do. They ended up in Switzerland. So Hernando was actually raised in Switzerland, and his dad was always talking about how beautiful and wonderful Peru is. So he finally gets a chance to go back to Peru, and he finds it very different from Switzerland. So he starts researching why developing countries constantly struggle and don't seem to develop out of the challenges of corruption and challenges of finance and capital. And so his book, The Mystery of Capital, talks about how here in the developed world, United States, Canada, England, New Zealand, Australia, we have this invisible infrastructure of ownership and public records and property taxes. And when you go into Mexico and South America, Central America, countries settled by Spain or Portugal, they didn't, the, the, the settlers did not put the emphasis on ownership. And they did not put the emphasis on public records and keeping track of things. It's a fuzzy uh, system that I've discovered as I did research in Mexico. So understanding all that, uh, Hernando has worked for decades trying to convince these developing countries to start allowing, uh, in fact, a lot in Mexico particularly, they have squatters rights, where if you don't protect your property, keep your property uh, fenced in and looked at and taken care of, and as some squatter comes and sits on your property and you don't contest that, in fact, if you leave your property unattended for uh, three to four months, 
uh, you, the, the squatter can actually approach a constable in the village and they can witness you moving into a vacant house. And anyway, it's a very fluid, unstable system. So when you have squatter rights versus in the United States, we have homestead rights. And there's an interesting history that goes back to Abraham Lincoln in 1860s when he was able to pass the Homestead Act. And the concept for Hernando is to try to transfer the squatters into owners so that they can hold title and begin to develop capital and have some sort of vested interest in the community through ownership. And also at the same time, he has the concept of the informal economy, meaning business street vendors, business people that have auto repair shops that have never had a business license. They have no registration and no evidence of ownership. So it's the informal economy of what they do, their goods and services, and also their land that they're squatting on. So after generations and decades of him trying to influence people, the idea that I've come up with and we're working on is developing a smartphone app where individuals will be able to download the app in their developing country. And then the app is designed so that you can touch a button and it picks up the longitude and latitude of the location where you're standing, which is the right front corner, the left front corner of your property, the back right corner, back left corner. So you can get a, a rough quadrant footprint survey of the property you've been squatting on for 30 years. And that information gets uploaded into a database where we need a blockchain foundation. And that's why I'm talking to all you guys to see if there's a connection we can make. And at the same time, the individuals are able to take pictures of their auto repair shop or their tire shop or their chickens if they raise and sell chickens and their business so they can start a registration of who they are and what they do, where they live, where their business is. They take street views, photographs, they upload a digital database of who they are and where they are. And we call that a geo identity. So it's connecting of who you are to where you live and where you where you're from. And by the way, here in the developed world, you pull out your driver's license, that's a geo identity, who you are and where what where, where you live. So this is why this is important to start helping the developing countries develop different things. Sometimes they have a government ID that would be uploaded into the database. We would get birth certificates, marriage certificates, university certificates, try to establish a digital folder and we call it a geo vault so that they can access it if they need it and when they need it. Now, people ask me, well, how do you entice people to upload all this really good information? And this data becomes very valuable as it grows and grows. So we developed a micro lending platform as part of the app so that think Facebook, where you have a borrower, a peer borrower in a developing country and a peer lender in one of the developed countries. So the peer borrower in application for the $100 to $1,000 micro loan uploads all this information as part of the loan application. The lenders are then able to look through the different applications and maybe identify somebody that they would like to help. Now this is a loan, this is not a gift and this is not a donation. So with this, they're able to open a correspondence via email or WhatsApp or some sort of communication until the lender feels confident in lending that $100, that $500, that $1,000. And now this is another place where we need help and where you guys, we might all collaborate on this. We would like the lender to then buy, purchase $100, $500, $1,000 worth of a cryptocurrency. And then via the cryptocurrency is transferred to the borrower and we need some sort of ATM set up in the, in the Philippines, in particular, where we want to start, where that borrower then with their phone and once they've registered and been approved, can go in and go to an ATM and retrieve the pesos, the $100 US or the $500 US converted to pesos so that they can go out and buy more chickens, buy more goats, hmm. start a taxi service. So anyway, long story made short, 
I, I'm at nine minutes. Am I running over already? No, no. Um, please go ahead. Um, I'll, I'll let you finish up here, and then I'll, we have a, our first comment from Mila Smith. Okay, so real quick, I'll finish up. So the cryptocurrency is also the system for paying back the loan. So at that same secured spot ATM, the pesos are put back into the ATM, converted to that cryptocurrency, shipped back to the lender, who then can convert them back to US dollars or whatever. Eventually, if it's successful, the cryptocurrency becomes the fiat for doing business in that developing country. It becomes the master. So you no longer have to go to the ATM. You can go to other businesses that are part of the system and say, hey, I need to buy tires. I'm going to pay you with the crypto money. So I love the, it. That's the eventual vision. And the reason this would work is because most of these developing countries are so disorganized. I, I don't know what else to say that yeah. that it's just like the, before they know it, before the government understands that something happens, we're going to be have our feet in there and our, our hands connected. Now, here's where the government comes in. Everybody asks this. The government's got a buy in. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I've been to the Philippines and I talked to one of the mayors and he said, ah, if you could do this, we would love this, because guess what? Once we identify who lives where and what their property corners are and how many square feet or square meters it is, we can collect property taxes, which we've never been able to collect. So the government will buy in. Eventually. Yeah, they will. They will. Now, um, if my experience government with, with government, you got to be patient. It's a long yeah. process and there's a bit, generally bidding process in the U S um, we had done a number of, bids for you know county recording parallel recording and we're still waiting <laughs> um but but if you're patient and in fact developing countries i think would probably move more swiftly um and in fact speaking of philippines um mila smith says squatters are very difficult to remove from the land they're squatting in the philippines part of the problem is the record keeping title ownership ownership record so Can yeah I, let me address that yeah so we have a we have contacts on the ground in the philippines particularly we're focusing on a island chain called cebu c-e-b yeah i've heard of it yep beautiful anyway so they have these master uh, i don't know the term it just lost but they've already got some rough land surveys already done but they're fuzzy the individual yeah. we're working with his family owns uh hectares and hectares of land They've got squatters on the property. Wow. They are willing to do either lease, lease purchase or or financing or something. So what they would like to do is get this implemented so that they could start identifying who's where and then be able to approach them on a legal basis saying, here's our family title. Here's the documentation of what we've got. And you're here let's negotiate and work something out and at the same time the government buys in because they're going to get property taxes and the property taxes can fund the the courts or the arbitration of these squatter challenges in the philippines this is what the landowners want this is what the mayors want this is what everybody wants they want to identify who the squatters are where they are and what their footprint is they want to figure out what those boundaries are so we can yeah. start bringing some sort of solid solution to the mess yes absolutely and and, it, and it's important to address these things and i think I, I definitely believe that blockchain technology can be that um i have read mystery of capital it's, oh, been, good. A, it's been a while it's been many number of years um i know many people have quoted de soto over the years and i know that he's definitely pro blockchain technology and certainly other ways of measuring, you know, land surveys, that kind of thing. Um, before, I, without, before I run out of time, yep. before I run out of time, I got to make, so to quote Jerry Maguire, show me the money. If anybody is in this presentation needs to understand, if we can get success with this, it, the data becomes extremely valuable. Absolutely. Uh, you, it, hopefully everybody can see that it's a money maker. And I, I don't have to go into the detail, but it's a huge moneymaker. And one more thing, I've already been approached or we've talked tangentially with Google. And they said, look, if you can get a million downloads, call us. In other words, once you hit that, that's their critical mass. If you get a million of anything, you've got a movement. 
and then they as a 500 pound gorilla or other facebook or somebody else will will pay attention we we've, we've got contacts in the philippines we have the niece of a lady that has the largest multi-level organization in the philippines she has three million people in her download and her downline she's got three million email email addresses so the, wow. the minute we send this out with a link what we got to do our beta test there's all kinds of work that has to be done when we're, we're ready to launch they're on board they will send this out and all of these downloads you have to understand they may get a loan they may not regardless we got the we're crowdsourcing the work they're giving us a lot of information they make and hopefully we can get the loans we got to get the peers involved there might be institutional lenders that want to jump on board but once we got that million download we've got clout you do and, and, and in fact yeah so i guess we actually have uh, you know five more minutes here well four minutes here now um you know this that's it's interesting we could certainly ubiquity could certainly help from a parallel re like records point of view um, we have a new solution on top of that, that works in parallel with unanimity uh, called it's called NFT for short, but it's non fungible title platform. And we're working with a vendor right now um, to facilitate that. But we can also do non fungible title records, title policy or any kind of a land record and turn that into a digital um a history with with with, uh, with distributed storage i don't want to get too nerdy here but the technology is called ipfs interplanetary file system which really allows you to do distributed peer-to-peer -peer storage of files in a secure and encrypted manner and then also record it to the blockchain using unanimity uh so we can help with that but again we're blockchain agnostic in this in effect if someone has a better solution please work with them we, you know, I don't just use these these webinars just to push ubiquity. I want anyone with the best solution to, to bring it forward, and maybe we can all work together, right? Um, that's how I have to, you know, and believe. Can I can I address some of these comments on the right real quick? Please, yeah. Well, how about this? So, so, so how about I ask with? So, um, uh, Amila had mentioned that her father had to pay out squatters to move out. I, that's and then, the one I want to address on. Okay, okay. please go ahead. Okay, so in the developed world, and again, I got a little bit of a history background on this and it's the British we need to thank here in the United States. The British laid a foundation for us. In fact, I'll try to be brief. Uh, it's a great an anecdotal story that they don't tell you in school, but George Washington was a real estate agent. He was not a land surveyor. He would go out and land survey, and then he, he would mark off the property, and then he would hire people, or people would subcontract to work the land and pay him rent. So prior to the American Revolution, he went out and there were squatters on his property. And he looked around and he said, there's no legal entity to enforce my rights to push these people off. Hmm. Lo and behold, he gets, he gets a letter from Philadelphia that says, hey, we're gathering for this thing we're going to call the Continental Congress. His motivation for going to Philadelphia was to establish some sort of government to enforce land rights. So to answer your question, once we start mapping and establishing who owns what, now the governor, the mayor, the chief of police, everybody starts to opt in and buy into this public record system, which we take for granted here in the United States. In Mexico, you can't look at land records unless you're a notary. I, I won't go into that, but it's a mess. Yeah. So it, yeah. Go ahead. And one I was just saying, as, as a comment in Canada, in Canada where I where I live. I live in Toronto, small city. No, it's a huge city. It's the biggest city in, in, in the country. It's like a mini oh, New York. York. Yeah, it's like a mini New York, near New York. Um, we we have 99 year leases from the Crown, sort of a corporation run by the Queen. And they give you, if you can homestead north, you can make it happen. You have it for at least 99 years. Yeah. So, so, so these are the things we want to solidify and we want to clarify is that way if squatters come on your property here in the United States, you got the federal, state, and local government and all the courts enforcing your rights to go get the squatters and move them off. We've got that. That's what they're lacking in the developing world. They don't understand that these public records, these property taxes are the way that you fund the government to enforce your property rights so he doesn't have to pay to get somebody to move, to 
stop squatting on his property. I know the developing world squatters rights is is a major problem. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I appreciate your presentation. We are you can still, you know, there's questions you can continue to chat on there. Uh, we're bringing on Wes Williams. Um, thank you again. Thank you again, uh, Rex. Great presentation, and I hope to have you on a future um, webinar with us. Okay, we'll continue the conversation. So uh, we will bring on Wes. Hopefully, Wes is able to join us today. Um, are you able to close your video, Rex? I can try to close yours. Hopefully, it'll close the whole. Oh, I'll screen. close. I'll close that. I'll close. Okay, that. beautiful. Hey, Wes. Hey, Nathan. Oh. Hey, how you doing? Hey, so uh, thank you so much. So this is Wes Williams. Uh, Wes is a member owner of Ubiquity. Um, he has worked as our, our attorney at, in, in the past, um, and he his presentation is Title Insurance, Real Estate, and Cryptocurrency in Attorney's Perspective. I gave you that description there. <laughs> um, hopefully that works for you, and um, I'll let you have the floor. No, thank you. I honestly, I didn't have anything prepared. I, I do. Oh, just sincere, well, you know, we, you know, we always. Sincerest oh. apologies. Every time I've come on with you, it's always been a, like a conversational type. Uh, I prefer that a lot of times. Yeah. If, if, listen, if if you want to join in and ask questions and kind of chat with me, I would love that. Rather than kind of give it some sort of dissertation about title insurance, other than give some thoughts on my my perspective. I'm no longer in the title insurance industry, by the way. Oh, okay. yeah, because you're in the gaming industry now. Metaverse, yeah, I worked, right? I, I I took a I took a job as um, legal counsel for a video game e-commerce company, and they're working in. I mean, they work with uh, all sorts of uh, in, from anywhere from independent to big um, like commercial video game developers and uh, companies. Basically, they allow for um, uh, these companies to. Uh, to it, so if you're, say, say, for example, you built a video game, uh, I'll give an example like Roblox because Ro I think they, they actually work with Roblox. If you want to go and sell um, in-game items like skins or swords or you know any other kind of digital asset, um, you need to move money around, right? So uh, there, you need to pay for these things. Uh, this company functions as a, pay a payment, sort of a payments process, the kind of the only words I can describe it, um, uh, the Shopify, if you will, of um, the video game industry. So if you if, if you want to, um, you know, monetize your video game e ecosystem, this company will do it, among other things. I mean, they they have a full suite of uh, offerings that they offer to the video game industry. But nevertheless, they're getting involved in cryptocurrency and NFT blockchain technology, kind of similar to, you know, what the real estate industry has been doing. But Interestingly enough, the real estate industry has been very slow to adopt the technology. Um, you know, the it kind of makes sense if you're a video game to uh, you know adopt this technology because uh, video games have always kind of had this um, uh, token monetization incentive system built into their games. And you know, in in some respects, a lot of these currencies can be worth money out uh, real world fiat currencies outside of our you know, mm -hmm. what we have in the US, US dollar. But getting back to title insurance, so, and I didn't even give my background, but like I said, I've been on this thing with you for a long time, so. Um, oh yeah, we've been going back, if, yeah, we've had many webinars, many, many great times on these webinars in the past uh, on Crowdcast yeah. for sure. Yeah. Oh, totally, and it's always the same. Like, I I mean, I, I feel like I'm giving the same spiel as I did way back then, but now a lot of these things are kind of getting, you know, getting built out like back then there were just a few transactions that happened in uh, using cryptocurrency right or involving cryptocurrency in some way and now it's a lot more but nothing's really changed so i mean these transactions at least here in the u.s they're still getting done yeah, everybody wants to has these this, these ideas these grandiose ideas that you know they're going to be able to purchase real estate with bitcoin it's going to be very seamless you're just basically adding in additional steps but that additional step is just essentially the exchange of your cryptocurrency into us dollars so in some ways this is just a all cash deal but you have an inter another intermediary in the mix um is you know either bitpay or forum pay or one of the other uh companies out there that or you big big pay, power well, you pay in partnership with rocket fuel <laughs> uh, exactly so yeah, there's, yeah. Saying, there's there's alternatives right i mean but these are the, the same exchange intermediaries for purposes of uh, uh converting your uh, cryptocurrency into U.S. dollars because right now, from a, a legal perspective, um, 
you know, you can't really purchase, uh, uh, truly purchase a, an asset like a real estate using a cryptocurrency. I mean, you can, but there's all these crazy steps to do it. And none mm -hmm. of the counterparties to these transactions are going to want to accept cryptocurrencies. I mean, the taxing authority is not going to accept, at least not right now, right? We're all hoping. That well, that's we, yeah, we, we are working with some title firms that are helping to facilitate that. Um, and they have counterparties that are willing to accept. But yeah, we, we do, the inter intermediaries are still the title firms and underwriters for sure. Right, right. And and yeah. until there's legal clarity around stable coins, because even though those, listen, I, I, I and you and I have been pushing towards this and it's going to happen. I'm not, I'm not skeptical. I mean, I'm saying it will happen. It's going to take time. And um, yeah. eventually you will start to see things, yeah. Right, you'll start to see these, uh, because more and more, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing, it, you know, out of, um, uh, at the federal level, you're you're seeing you know bills like the uh, Loomis and Gillibrand bill that's been proposed, kind of um, you know laying down you know kind of laying a foundation for the classification of certain types of tokens, and then um, who essentially would, would regulate these tokens, and then um, particularly the one regarding stable coins, and I think there was some additional stable coin legislation. I, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of talk around stable coins because ultimately if we can get mm -hmm. stable coins figured out and, and get to a point where they're sort of kind of blessed by the, the federal government in, in, to, in some respects, then you'll start to see um, title companies accepting and holding and dispersing in those types of tokens because they, they're not volatile. They're backed by hopefully the US dollar or some equivalent of that. And then they're by institutions that are regulated, yeah. which is what you know, title companies want to make sure that they're dealing with regulated entities. You know, um, they don't want to. They want a, a, a mechanism in place to avoid, uh, you know, uh, funds being diverted in some way, and they want to be able to track these funds and know who these funds are coming from because all of those regulations are still in place, right? You know, know your customer, uh, AML considerations. Yeah, like absolutely, absolutely. Well, you know, I, I always say, and I said this earlier, that you know, you're a really big part of helping us navigate and save ourselves a lot of headaches and time um, with the regulatory and legal perspectives um, as it pertained to uh, things like AML, KYC. And it's, it's nice that we have partners like Rocket Fuel, uh, Peter Jensen, CEO, he'll be speaking a little bit later, uh, but they do the KYC, all that stuff automated, which is just beautiful. And uh, they're based out of California. Um, I think they have an office at 90210 in Beverly Hills too, which is pretty cool. Um, but um, you know, yeah, absolutely. And we're working with them and, and another provider. But oh, you know, we for ourselves just having an option on our site, having you know over a hundred cryptocurrencies. I know that it fluctuates. I think we say 130 plus, but a, I think it's probably a few less than that. But it's still over a hundred or something, at least 120. Um, and they, and, and in fact, like they, they, you know, supporting stable coins and stuff is really important to you. I know that obviously we have, uh, our, you know, our, our ideas with smart escrow. Um, certainly I took a step back with smart escrow and thought just from a computer s science and computer security perspective, just, um, building it in a module piece work piece by piece testing it, get the software certifi certification, ensure it's regulated, make sure it's rock solid on proper servers, and then make it an interoperable solution into Ubiquity Pay. Um, and then obviously it'll trickle down through add-ons like our crypto listing service, which by the way is not an MLS. We work with MLSs, but we are not registered as an MLS pursuant to regulations with uh, our, our uh, the National Association of Realtors. <laughs> That's our disclaimer. But um, wow. yeah, and that, that actually that actually sounds uh, amazing. I mean, honestly, what you what you just laid out sounds kind of thank really you. intriguing. Oh, thank you. Yeah, we've we've taken a bit of a more, more more of a pragmatic approach. I'd say stoic in some cases too. Now that the crypto market has uh, tanked, but seems to be rising again. Um, but certainly, like I want everything to tie into itself. I want to have the parallel recording through unanimity. We open sourced unanimity finally, by the way, Wes. Um, we have a cloud hosted solution and so people can build upon the code base. I want to give back to the community who's been so patient. Um, you know, certainly we made a, a lot of money. Uh, I think it was like a, a well, 17 to 18 X ROI on uh, times, you know, ROI on unanimity time to open source it, get the code base built out and then um, have a hosted cloud solution for any enterprises that want to have parallel recording. But at the same time, still, 
allow other people to take advantage of some of the other tools we have uh, that are you know proprietary at the moment. So, um, oh, Mila wants you to post your contact info. I think you've did you post it? Oh yeah, here you go. I think you have uh, you have a few more minutes. Actually, you have ten more minutes there, Wes. Um, we, but uh, oh. So yeah, um, but anyway, yeah, you know, we've, you know, things have come a long way. I think that the approach we're taking is certainly good. And I'm so proud of you, Wes, because your dream, I remember, I remember you saying to me last year, last year, like a little bit earlier than, than now, uh, you know, maybe May of 2021, you said, oh, yeah, this metaverse thing is big. I'm like, I don't know. And then it, it exploded, and I was wrong on that one. <laughs> you know, or I was, I was, I was a little bit too cautious, and it, and it blew up bigger than I thought it would, so. Well, here, here's the thing. I mean, this industry is not going away, right? So it's going to have its peaks and valleys all the time, kind of like any market. It's going to have its ups and downs, and it, it, it goes through the bear markets. Then we go through these bull market runs and then a bear market. So right now, I think it's it's like everybody can kind of chill out for a little bit, build and and uh, you know build out their their systems or platforms, and then um, you know take advantage of, of the wave when it come, hits again. So, listen, yeah. traffic isn't going away. Yeah. And I, I like the fact that we're kind of – we're – at least the, from the U.S. perspective, that we, we continue to talk and have you know dialogue around uh, the, the regulation of crypto. Because once yeah. we once we can get it regulated in a good way, then we can start building these crazy um, innovative things and and take uh, and obviously do it within a in the parameters of a legal framework. Like for example, in real estate, like I I think people are kind of like what's cool is like people are talking about. Um, uh, real estate settlements using cryptocurrencies, but now we have these uh, uh, tokenized properties. You know, Proppy's mm -hmm. been doing them, and then there's yeah. other companies been doing them. The company that I, I was working on, a, working with a company called Zifty, um, they um, they're doing something completely innovative. Um, they, they're tokenizing, and actually, what's what's here's the thing: because right now there is such uncertainty about the, the classification of tokens, you don't know whether or not what what you're creating could be considered a security by the sec because that's a big thing right everybody's kind of trying to avoid having to do it you know uh, you know launch a security when they're not properly doing it they're, they're not properly following uh, you know regulatory guidelines where they have to you know uh, you know you know give notification registration and 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 follow you know all the legal framework it's very expensive to to do a securities offering so if you want to make sure that you're doing it properly um, you know, creating these tokens, you, you got to make sure you follow all the legal framework. I think doing creating a token that's that is an, a, a true interest in 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 real property is kind of innovative. So these guys have done it based on a long term lease. So they so basically what they're doing is they, they take a long term lease, create uh, uh, and, and then basically lease it out, right? And then they have they create a master lease that points to um, a a a, a, uh, a public key address on the blockchain, and then it, that 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 key points back to uh, the cryptographic key points back to the the land records. I, I think there's a couple of companies that have done this, but you can do this with any blockchain. And then um, you're essentially transferring uh, an interest in real estate that doesn't necessarily have to be recorded after that. Oh, did I did I block? No, I, I actually I wanted to mention real quick, not to cut you off. Um, I I, I my just everyone, you're, you're all going to laugh at this looking back. I, for some reason, had a laptop charger and it is no longer working. So I'm using a, a high powered cell phone charger. So I'm going to toggle everyone's video as my battery power goes down slowly. <laughs> so hopefully this is okay. Can, can, yeah. can you hear me? Can everybody hear you? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, we can still hear you. Perfect. Well, I, I don't know how much more time I have. And it's, I mean, but my, my, my yeah. point being is um, you can really, you, you can tokenize something that, that shouldn't be a security that is an interest in real property because the issue is actually having to, to, to tokenize a deed, right? Because we don't have a mechanism for uh, a legal mechanism because we have a deeds based system. Uh, here in the U.S., and in order to give constructive notice, the law says you have to record your interest in the county in which the property is located. And I talked about this before, but there's no mechanism for um, giving constructive notice by way of a blockchain. It's always a dual record system. So then that brings yeah. me to this whole other thing is why title insurance companies created their own separate mechanisms is for their or their own purposes. They they have their title plants, which are essentially mirror images of the the land records. 
my, my point being is all this and, and like I can go on and on and on, but I have very short limited time. But these things are happening and we got to figure out a way to, to to basically create a mechanism like this to where you can pull it off off the, the property off the land records and transfer ownership by way of blockchain to make it obviously easier and then take advantage yeah. of like De DeFi protocols which you can you know that there will be a value associated with with that token because it points back to the land and then yeah. you can take advantage of DeFi protocols similar like maker dow right yeah yeah well I, i'm gonna say this so so ubiquity is taking um really has gone a, a long way with um, Rainier Title. Uh, so Rainier Title, obviously, in Washington State now is subsidiary of Stewart. Uh, we're working on a number of these these um, projects. We'll have some announcements soon. I don't want to make any kind of you know premature announcements, but we've gotten a lot of development done, and there's going to be some big news soon from uh, that perspective. And um, uh, it's quite exciting, actually. Um, and the, you know, there'll be participation from a number of different counterparties. And we're uh, really excited. I can't say more than that, but there'll be, you know, there's 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 the NFT, the non fungible title, title policies using blockchain tech and um, using non fungible records, and, and and then having a, a really good chain of title and chain of custody, distributed storage, and then also taking on a lot of these, you know, these uh, title plant type of, of systems that are in place today. You know. Um, mm. In various you know jurisdictions, but I would say if people want to learn more about that, they go to ubiquity.io slash NFT. So it's non fungible title. That's our new brand, um, and that is, yeah. I mean, that's that's what, what did we call it before, Wes? And we called it something else. Oh, my my NFTs. It was going to be called my NFTs. Well, it's actually called uh, you know non fungible title now. Um, so there's a question here is from Mila Smith. Uh, in, Creating a token in reality, do you need to register it anywhere? Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, I can only speak for the U.S. how how title how title works here. Um, in other in other jurisdictions, I, I I don't know. I mean, if if it's if, from the perspective of the Philippines, I mean, it's really you know, title is only as good as the courts that enforce the, the courts in the legal system that that kind of enforce your rights, right? I mean, so it's. And we, we have a system here that you know you record your interest in the county recorder's office, and obviously, if you own the property, you can go into court and basically say. And I, I'm listen. This is very simplistic overview, but then you can enforce your rights uh, to the real, you know, to your real estate in court. Say, here's my deed, and everybody can see it. In other jurisdictions, I don't know, so I don't necessarily know that if it's based on the jurisdiction's laws. If they, you know, if they say, hey, you know, re recordation on a blockchain. Is legal and valid, and we will accept that. And therefore, therefore, you're the owner. Great, but if they don't enforce that, then it's 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 meaningless, really. Uh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And um, how cooperative are title companies with using blockchain tech? Well, I can answer that. You know, uh, Rainier Title is is one of the leaders in that area in Washington State, and um, they're certainly excited about the technology. I'm not sure about other title companies besides obviously properties the fact that they own a title company now <laughs> um i'm not sure of others i know that there's a lot of interest from old republic um i know that um fidelity we have spoken with fidelity in the past first american but um all you know all the all the big four have certainly had some interest and have had pilots in the past uh i can sp i can speak to the land records um, industry that uh, I went to, I remember uh, five, six years ago, they were anti, or the American Land Title Association was cautiously optimistic, no, cautiously cautious about it, and now they're cautiously optimistic, and they've had speakers, and in fact, they've really embraced us. We're actually members now of, all, of ALTA, and um, did you know that? Did you know that they just put out a video on cryptocurrency that Andrew Zankel was on? And yep. Um, Alex Can uh, Alexander yeah. Kanan and um, Pro uh, Piper Moran. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So they actually inspired me to have this webinar. <laughs> I thought, well, we got to have one as well, just to kind of, you know, s s share our perspective as well. So uh, good for them. So everyone, you know, just so you know, my f this is not charging very well on my computer here. So if I do lose you, I will join back on my phone and then I'll just continue it. So this might be like a two piece. But our, don't worry, though, we're going to continue to have it. Oh, in fact, now we have Santiago who's going to join. So while I 
I'm going to join my web. I'm going to turn my phone now and see if I can just continue this conversation. So bear with me, everybody. I'm going to join the webinar and see if I can join and then transfer the hosting here. Oh, boy. Okay. Nathan, do you still need me on? I mean, uh, no, I, you can hop off. Um, I'm going to have uh, Santiago join because that's his turn. But thanks so much for your perspective. I really appreciate it, Wes, as always, Thank man. Bye-bye. Right, Thank you. Thank you. Hey, I'm going to turn off your video for just a second there, Santiago. Uh, just yeah. For my phone, I'm going to join here through Crowdcast on my other device. I got to look at okay. And then hopefully we, we'll, we'll just move this over. Uh, let's see here. Loading video stream. Oh, whoa. Feedback. Yeah, I just need to turn down one of the devices to avoid the echo. Can you hear me? Can you hear us? Hey, Nathan. Can you hear us? Can anybody in the audience uh, tell me if you're hearing me, please? Maybe in the chat? Okay. Video and audio okay? Peter, okay. Thanks, Bernardo, Peter, Mila, Daniel. I think we're on. Um, well, I don't know if I will be... I'm supposed to wait for Nathan to reconnect, I guess. Uh, otherwise, I'll be starting. So, yeah, maybe... Okay, yeah, Nathan is back. So... Okay, yeah, go ahead, please. Do a go quick ahead, intro. please. I will do a quick intro and then I will we'll give the, the main question that will be bugging around our mind and hope uh, you can get the answer by yourself by the end of this talk and by the end of uh, all the conclusions that Nathan and all the amazing speakers uh, have gave you as insights. So I'm Santiago Morfin, I'm an affiliate at Ubiquity for LATAM expansion. I'm also a consultant regarding blockchain, innovation, green tech. So basically, uh, my mission today is to give you a big question. Is crypto real estate a utopia or is it the perfect merge? Right? Because why is this question important? Because normally crypto guys and real estate guys don't get along with each other and um, well, at least that was the way it was, right? So they were like, you know, boomers are into investing bricks and millennials and tenials are into going to crypto altcoins and play to earn metaverse, etc. right? But now it's like, you don't need necessarily to fight among each other or to invest in one asset, but not the other. Actually, as we are gonna explore now, the two worlds that uh, once uh, seemed to be very distant are quite emerging, aren't they? Let's let's find out. So I will start my talk uh, talking about some uh, mega trends, right? So uh, one of the key mega trends I want to first touch is the crypto adoption and regulation, right? This a massive adoption going on and regulation. So don't be fooled by the crypto winter. 
if you go to <laughs> to the greed greed index greed and fear index uh, we've been facing uh, months of uh, extreme fear right and now it's, it's a bit balancing confidence is going a bit back bitcoin and other icons have uh, improved around 15 20 percent the last week thanks god <laughs> but don't be fooled around all the crisis right because we are living in a very complicated geopolitical socioeconomic context right it's not just crypto is the stock market is almost any industry despite well some industries that will uh, keep going on as uh, agro uh, of course some real estate and some uh, basic uh, things we all need to live on right so the crypto winter is here but it's not because the crypto fundamentals are bad is because the global context is complicated you have a war russia ukraine you have a alimentary crisis water crisis in some cases a lot of political instability not just in the us of course in, in latin and around many countries and of course uh, nasdaq stock market going down and there's a huge correlation between the nasdaq and the crypto market so far uh, but eventually, uh, crypto investors um, will get back. the the bull The bull market will 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 go back. So the big point here is, despite the pricing, look at the fundamentals. Right, crypto is all about decentralization. It's about security encryption. It's about people reclaiming their sovereignty over their own money, data. That's where Web3 comes go. Um, and basically all their life. It's about decentralization, democratization. That's the point of blockchain and that's the point of using blockchain for real estate. And that's not only crypto, but it includes crypto. So where does crypto real estate starts? Well, it starts with some solutions as ubiquity. The most basic thing you can get around crypto real estate is buying a real asset, real world asset using your crypto. That could be using a stable coin, like a USDT and let's not name UST because that's that. So good stable coins like USDT, USDC, Binance USD, BUSD and some others. We have also Mexican uh, stable coin now by uh, Tether as actually. And there's another one called PXO by uh, Dr. Eloisa Cadenas, which is a, a master PhD actually in, um, in crypto. So, well, you have the stable coin and you can buy with more than 130 cryptocurrencies using ubiquity pay so while well, that's for anyone holding crypto that want to get access to to buy a property or a fraction of, of a property another key trend to talk about is tokenization and fractional ownership right real estate uh, has been booming and especially in um, very touristic spots millennials and other people that don't afford to buy the whole property want to buy a slice of it and enjoy what, what what's in it for rental vacation earnings for using themselves so basically this trend trend what allows you is to buy a fraction and enjoy um, the property and the earnings with blockchain you can tokenize that uh, using um, um, nfts basically so well just for you to know that's a big trend is happening if you're in mexico uh, and you go to riviera maya to loom and so on you'll see a lot of options to buy fractions but now what's really gonna boom is just not to buy fractions or the whole property is to buy it with crypto um i don't know how how familiar are you guys with uh, some hotspots as to loom but for example i'm a proud uh, to loom crypto club member we have a crypto club then there so it's it's beautiful we gather every wednesday wednesday and discuss uh, trends market and um, well basically everything going on on the crypto market and a lot of also crypto millionaires that go underground and just want to buy big big properties with crypto why not and just a uh, disclaimer with the, we are, we are talking with big real estate guys uh, willing to adopt uh, ubiquity pay to to buy to buy basically all their portfolio uh, you will they will be accepting crypto now and i think that for me it's very exciting cuz it's a thing i'm working on but it's just it's just the top of the iceberg it's just the most obvious thing that will be 
happening around. The next step for me is um, all the titlement going into a digital encrypted immutable unhackable way that that's where you, you get the e-title using NFTs. Maybe Nathan can, can talk about a bit later, just not to focus on, on ubiquity, but I mean, that's going on in Mexico is complicated because um, as uh, I think uh, Perry mentioned earlier, it's a mess. The property, the, the data is a mess. In the US is a bit more ordered, but anyway, in some countries will be uh, before and others after, but all the titlement and property registration in the future, in the near future, will be based uh, in the blockchain. All immutable and hackable with no corruption. And maybe what will delay is that uh, corruption is a, a way of sustaining some guys, so that will delay in some uh, places. And we also depend on, on regulation, unfortunately. So, well, um, yeah, I'm seeing some you stop, you stop. Are you talking of something like timeshares? Well, yes and no. Fractional ownership is not timeshare because you actually own, you're a co-owner, right? And that's a big, big difference. And you can do fractional ownership tokenizing or not tokenizing. Actually, almost all the guys doing fractional ownership in Mexico, they are doing uh, not no tokenizing. They, they are just, uh, you buy like a, a share of a trust. Um, that's one thing. In, in Mexico, we call uh, the trusts are called fideicomiso. So you are a copropietario in a fideicomiso. That's a more basic thing. But uh, yeah, I think the more modern startups will start to using tokenized um, solutions, right? Uh, yeah, for example, you can look out a uh, fraction class. Um, they're selling a, a, um, a development called Eleanor Tulum, and you can buy fractions there. Um, yeah not a promotion but anyway it's just a use of case and if you really go promote, and promote research, all you want you'll find tons of uh, promote promote all you want <laughs> yeah you'll find tons of options uh in in Rivera maya and cabos uh, baja california san miguel de allende and also which is the Euro fintech right now it's been tokenized everything uh, um, even maguey plantations for for mezcal so take a look at maguey they are also launching the same tokenized um, democratization of investment in in agro uh, for their roots for um what do you call the taro well basically that's uh, real estate and investment trust yeah cacao token so basically you buy a portion of land that is a productive land, uh, rather for mezcal, chocolate, or other other products. So, and and now it's been tokenized. So basically, that means people with very few capital will get access to investment. So, what's the point of tokenizing real estate or agro investment? Is to democratize. It's not just to be fancy or to use a buzzword and say, "Hey, we are using blockchain. We are tokenizing." We are getting more people access to investment, and that's one of the key mega trends of the world. Uh, yeah, I don't want to extend that much here, but also uh, I will move to another um, major mega trend, which is the metaverse. Right. So the metaverse is is that sci-fi world. Yeah, just just so you know, I have two minutes before, or one minute before the Q and A. Yeah. 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 One more, you could, yeah. One yeah. One minute before you have a question and answer period. Yeah. So basically, in the metaverse is, is this virtual science sci-fi sci world where all the major uh, emerging techs, high tech like AI, VR, AR, um, blockchain, of course, is um, enabled and accelerated by not only 5G but now is 6G coming. Um, well, high-speed internet and gets you immersed into a parallel world. So the point for me to respond a bit of the question I make at the same is you have all these major mega trends going on and you have this real world. So the best projects that will excel are not those that are purely virtual, purely uh, metaverse, let's say an MMO, a massive uh, multiplayer online game or a play to earn or um, Sandbox, Decentraland, it's not just the purely digital metaverse or the purely uh, brick, brick real estate. Those projects that will excel, 
The others are those that merge, that can get all those world together. The millennials, the boomers, pay with crypto, fractional ownership, uh, a metaverse. For example, not all the metaverse are just these virtual lands. You have uh, OVR over the reality where every land is georeferentiated. You can go there, find your own home be because the whole earth is there and you can buy the, the 15 square meters surrounding your home or 30 or 40 or whatever. So the point is uh, the projects that merge the virtual world and the mega trends and the real world are the ones that will excel more. And for me, that's the definition of um, crypto real estate. And I think it's not a utopia. It's already here. If you want to look for examples, go to Satoshi Island, for example, where you buy an NFT and then you buy a piece of land in a crypto paradise. And it's, that's just one that is very trendy now, but yeah. I spotted yeah. around around five crypto islands. And just to yeah, so, so, so to just sorry to cut you off, we, you we, off. We, we have a Q&A portion, portion now. So is there a question that people have for you? Well, mm, I don't know. Yeah, because I'm on my phone, so I can't see the chat too well. The chat too well. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the chat. There was Miller Smith asking about the timeshare for fractional ownership. It's been answered. Okay. Um, yeah, does anyone have any other questions for uh, Santiago here? We have a few more minutes for him. Yeah, I just want to close a bit with... Um, yeah, exactly. Megatoken.com, that's the one. Uh, look at it. It's amazing. So yeah, the tokenization is just going on because they fundraise a lot of money with traditional investors. But my point is why to tokenize is to democratize uh, investment. It's not just to be fancy, trendy or to say, hey, I use blockchain. Let's fundraise tons of millions of dollars from a VC. That doesn't work anymore. <laughs> so, so yeah, thanks God. Uh, my point, uh, going back to Satoshi Island, and all, um, there's a lot of crypto islands now going on and metaverse and everything. So it will be more common to buy actual properties using whatever crypto you hold, rather stablecoin or whatever crypto, um, buy it via NFTs, tokenize. Now it's just like you, you have some headlines like uh, Bitcoin City in El Salvador with Bitcoin is a legal tender. By the way, that will happen in, in way more countries. But that's just a highlight, but it will be more common and it will be worldwide. And yeah, you'll know when I get my own uh, crypto island, which is going to happen. But <laughs> yeah, will not spoil it. But th the thing is, this is the new norm. This is not just um, a bunch of hippie projects. This is the new norm. And even the big players are getting in. If you want an example, just look, Santander is in the in the metaverse of uh, Data Casas in, in, in Spain. You have Citi estimating um, the, the metaverse to be a 13 trillion market, 13 trillion market by 2030. So it's not just a um, tech thing for millennials and tenials. For me, it's not a utopia. For me, it's like the merch, like the real deal we are, we are living. So you got to question yourself, how do I get in? Uh, start by, by using some crypto, some uh, DeFi, decentralized finance, Web3. Uh, educate yourself every day, at least one or two hours in, in crypto and blockchain, because this is a very, very dynamic uh, place. So yeah, all info is there for free. So always stay curious and hustle and yeah, be a risk taker. Thanks. Thank uh, you. Yeah, Thank you so I much. Really appreciate it, uh, uh, Santiago. Great, great presentation. I'm going to. I'm going to... Yeah, it's like about yeah, another, minute. another minute. If anyone has any more anyone questions any more for Santiago or comments? We have 47 people with RFP, which is really impressive. Really impressive. Yeah, impressive. Yeah, amazing. Thanks all who joined. I, I will type in the chat my info. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, please absolutely. do. Um, and then anyone who wants to contact Santiago can do so. Uh, Santiago is helping us from the perspective of the affiliate program to Latin America. Yeah, and in I hope very close because we cannot uh, give um, advanced information or the least close. But uh, very big developers will now be accepting crypto with uh, Ubiquity Pay, and hopefully some yep. other yep. solutions. Right. So. 
Yeah, yeah we can't yeah, wait to share that information. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Mexico uh, property Mexico developers, developers, investors, investors uh, in the coming yeah, weeks. Coming weeks. weeks. Yeah, the future, the future is crypto. Yeah, yeah absolutely. There is. There is. Yeah. Okay, thank you so okay, much, you so much. Uh, Santiago. Uh, I will be bringing on our next speaker, who is uh, representing uh, Rocket Fuel Rocket Fuel Chain. Rock, rock, rocket yeah, fuel blockchain. I think it kind of covered many topics, but I hope it was um, illustrative for everyone. Um, also, for yeah, those it's who great. Have well, we already cut you off. Before, so you off here. Uh, it's the next speaker's turn, but we'll we'll settle we'll settle on it. Please run the chat. Please run the chat. Yeah. Okay. Uh, up next, if everyone can hear me, is Peter Jensen. Uh, one moment, please. Peter Jensen. Peter Jensen. Peter Jensen. Peter Jensen. Peter Jensen. Uh, one moment, please. Uh, Peter, I'll be joining, I'll be adding you back in the chat here. So bear with me. Oh. Okay. Hey, okay. Um, so I'm going to try to bring on Peter one more moment, please, everybody. Okay, uh, just a second, everybody. Sorry for this. People, let me see if I can add. Let me see if I can add Peter here. Okay, I've invited Peter onto the screen. Um, Peter Jensen's uh, the CEO of Rocket Fuel. I'm not sure if he's. Oh, there we go. Peter, can you can you hear us? Perfect. I can hear you. Great. Okay, I'll let you uh, start your presentation then. Right. I am happy to. I had a quick question. I haven't used this platform before. Is it possible to share my screen or? It sure is. Yeah. Um, I think there's a button that looks like a right, it looks like it's a right hand, uh, arrow. You should be able to see something like that. Oh yeah. Maybe. Yep. I, I see it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I click that and that should help you. Yeah. I don't know what. Okay. Screen sharing. There you go. Yeah. And then. Well, it's, it's allowed you to do a tab. I didn't use the wrong screen, screen, but I guess. It's okay. Well, okay, it's sharing my. That's fine. I can move things over. Can you see this now? Yes. Can you see the PowerPoint? Yep. You might want to maximize. Yeah. There you go. Perfect. That, that looks good. All right. Cool. So I'm going to just, uh, yeah. So fine. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. I'm just going to jump right into it. And um, please stop me if, uh, if, if you have questions, right, Nathan? But otherwise, um, I'll, I'll go through this. I. So, so it's what I want to talk about is really how can you pay with um, with uh, what do you call them um, crypto on the internet? Let me just make the screen a little bit bigger. Sounds good. Did, did it did it do it right or not? Looks great. Okay, great. All right, we'll go. So it, it did okay. So basically, it's all about uh, doing payments. And what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about a few things that. I think are relevant here um, because um, people always talk about the crypto winter and all of that. And uh, I think it's important to distinguish between two different phases of crypto. There's crypto as an asset, as an investment vehicle. And that's what people have been talking about for the past, I don't know, six, seven, eight years. And then there's what I see as the second phase, which is crypto as an in infrastructure. And that is technology that can be used for many things including payments and it's the latter that we're focusing on and i think that's really what's important and and, uh, and exciting at least for someone being here in silicon valley where during the last couple of decades we've seen so many new technologies that came out that changed many 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 different things and so um i don't know which currency is going to win i don't care and and neither should you there are going to be currencies out there and i i do believe that the majority of the popular currencies are going to be stable coins 
it's going to be the digital version of the dollar. As you know, China has already created their digital version of the Chinese one. So has India. We're a little bit behind here in this country, but we will catch up and there will be a digital version of the dollar. That's what most people are going to use as their cryptocurrency. It's just another currency, whether we call it Bitcoin, dollar, Ethereum. These are different currencies. Um, the beauty of the digital dollar is that there is no volatility. And that's why I think ordinary people will be using that one. But it's all about the technology the technological advan uh, advantages by using uh, crypto. That's what matters. So let's just uh, remember what is blockchain because crypto is built on blockchain. It's a technology. And I, I had a hard time understanding what the difference is. Um, and it helps when you look at it at, with, with the internet eyes because what the internet allowed us to do, if you look at the third box to the left, it allowed us to transmit information, information instantly, right? So in the old days, we send a letter and the internet allowed us to send information back and forth. And that allowed people to build all sorts of applications on top of it. And so when you look at block, blockchain, that's also technology. And you look at internet over the last 20, 30 years, every year there's, there's dating apps, there's home banking, there is all sorts of things that we hadn't thought about when uh, the internet came out in the uh, in the late 80s. And now we have blockchain. What is that all about? The difference is that where the internet was about transmitting information, blockchain is about recording and transmitting value instead. So instead of information, we're talking about value. And you can transmit it, but you can also record it. And that's where we hear about all these um, smart contracts. And I think this is specifically important for the real estate market because really what the what real estate is all about is valuable assets. And that's perfect, a perfect match for blockchain. And of course, I personally am focused on one of the killer apps, which is cryptocurrency and payments. But there are, I mean, you're talking about um about uh yeah, all sorts of other parts of the of the uh, real estate market with um uh, yeah, with titles and all of that. I mean, it's an old way of doing things that we've been doing for 100 years because we couldn't do it any other way. And, and now what we're going to see over the next 10 to 15 to 20 years is that um, more and more of these old processes are going to be replaced by um, technology-based um, solutions based on blockchain. Uh, good example. I love that example. Um, um, Uber and Lyft. At the end of the day, what you had was you had a very big market. We also had that in the real estate market, but we had a transportation market, right? And we had some old processes and some old technologies that made for a very inefficient system that customers didn't like. And now we just have something much better because we use the internet and the mobile technology. And the same thing is gonna happen in the real estate. And those who are gonna be successful and who are gonna make money are those who identify the old way of doing things and figure out how to fix that with the new technology. And that's the opportunity we have in front of us. So let's talk about payments. What is the problem in payments? If you think about it, a dollar in the US or anywhere in the world, it, it's circling around the system. And if you think about every time we move money from A to B, there's a fee to be paid. I call it a tax. And if you add it up over a year or two or 10 years, it adds up. So take an example, an employer, pays the employee a salary. There is a fee there, both for the um, payroll system and for the banks to handle it. Banks, they make billions of dollars. It's because nothing is free with the bank, right? And um, that goes to the employee. Now I get my salary. Now I'm gonna go to Best Buy and I'm gonna buy a TV. Well, I use my credit card. There's a three to 5% credit card fee that the merchant pays. Really, we think the merchant is paying that or do I, end up paying that at the end of the day. Of course I do, right? And then the vendor needs to pay their supplier. Maybe it's Samsung. Ah, Samsung is in Korea. Now I need to do a cross-border payment. It not only is it expensive, but it's also complicated with regulation and other things. And so if you take the same dollar, it moves around and there's that tax that could be five, 10%, depending on how much that dollar moves around. There's only one person to pay for that. That's us as consumers. And the opportunity, with blockchain and crypto is simply to make that more efficient. 
to reduce the fees and take that out. Imagine we can move it from just say 5% to 2.5%. We can use that for many things, for better hospitals, cheaper taxes, um, many, many, many things, right? We can decide that as a society. That is why I'm excited about this because it's very rare that you have a technology that can really change fundamentally how things are done in a very large market. We saw it with the internet, we saw it with mobile, and now we have the opportunity with um, blockchain technology. Very exciting. So, and this is why people should care about this, by the way. It is whenever you move money from A to B, can we make that more efficiently? Can we make it cheaper? Can we make it more secure? And all of that. So there are many types of ways where people um, move money. One way which we're focusing on initially, but we have many use cases. One is just standard payment, where a shopper pays something from a merchant. There's another one. We have some other customers. They're saying, you know what? I need to move $100 million every single month from the US to Germany. And it's not easy. I don't know if anyone has tried to, to move money. I, I also have a vendor up in Canada with uh, trying to move money um, up to Canada, just paying an invoice of 10,000. And we're trying to wire the money. It's possible, but there's always something that happens and we pay a fee. So yeah, um, <laughs> I can, I can attest to that as a Canadian running a U.S. company. Um, there are solutions. I think we use, we use wise.com. Um, and we have low fees and then we use email interact, but there's still fees associated, right? It's kind of, Frustrating. And the, and the thing is, there are, there are all sorts of solutions that try to fix the problem. But they're all based on the underlying inefficient architecture that we've been using for 50 years. And that's the problem. So, of course, you can optimize it, but not until you change the fundamental architecture uh, can you make progress. Um, but if we talk specifically about payment solutions, credit cards, right? They were invented before the Internet. No, 50 years ago, no wonder it's not efficient in the modern uh, society, let alone where we're going with the metaverse. It's, it's just going to get worse and worse. And the reason we're paying 3 to 5% is because there are many people involved and there's a lot of fraud. And we know this. There is fraud, right? And the beauty for a merchant is, well, if there's fraud, I don't have to pay for it. And the same thing for the, um, for the shopper. But at the end of the day, we do end up paying for it. And so if you can invent a system that is much more efficient, um, that doesn't have fraud, that's more secure, um, that doesn't have, uh, what do you call it, um, chargebacks, that don't have to clients. I mean, I think we've all tried to go to Mexico or some other country, and we have a perfectly valid credit card, plenty of money on it, plenty of balance on it, and it gets declined when we try to buy that beer at the, at, at the bar. That is, that's not good. And um, it's not, it's just because it's an inefficient system and they have all sorts of systems that try to, to prevent that. So the existing payment solutions are very inexpensive and inefficient for the merchants, but also for the shoppers. I mean, come on, as a shopper, how, how many accounts do I have around in the internet where every time they say, please store your credit card and please create an account? I probably 30, 40, 50 accounts out there. It's crazy. And I don't know about, about you, but sometimes I read the news and I say that, oh, this and this merchant has been compromised and two, two million credit cards were stolen. Have you ever thought, is that my credit card that's stolen? What is this going to mean to me? It's crazy. It's an inefficient system. But we've all gotten used to it. Just like we got used to hiring or calling a cab in the old days and you called it up and they, maybe they showed up, maybe they didn't. The wife was sad or mad because it was raining and she was cold and ah. And then when they finally showed up, they didn't accept credit cards. I mean, maybe it was just me. Maybe you guys never experienced that. But that's the user experience I got. We said, well, that's kind of what it is, right? I mean, what else can they do? They try their best. It didn't have to be like that. And today it's better. And the same thing is going to happen moving money from A to B, whether you're a consumer or business, whether it's B2C or B2B. Okay. So um, cross-border systems or cross-border payments, very complicated as well. and. Um, it's just the same problem. It's not fast. It's not reliable. It's expensive. It affects people's cash flow and so on. So those are the problems. And what we have designed is a foundation with which we can solve all these problems. Um, 
and it's all based on blockchain. So we're not really, I mean, we're not really inventing it. We have, we do have some inventions, but really we are leveraging the technology just like Jeff Bezos leveraged the internet to solve a problem. So. Exactly. Yeah. So, so, so we, we love what uh, rocket fuel has done for us. I mean, we had mentioned that we were working with some other payment providers, uh, but we are, you know, I'll be putting out a press release soon with your marketing division, just because your team has been so hands on and so innovative and really just the tools you built. I mean, we, there was, some, there was actually like a custom field that your team uh, we asked for and you got your team built it for us in a few days. I mean, that's the kind of hands on partnerships that we love at Ubiquity. So I really appreciate Thanks, that. Uh, well, how much did, and, and how much did we charge for that? Zero dollars. Oh. I, Zero I, I Bitcoin. To the guys, that was a mistake. They forgot yeah. to send you the amount. No, kidding. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, but, I'm but happy, uh, happy it was great. It. Yeah, it was great because um, I think you said something about it was like uh, pay with rocket fuel. I said, well, can't you have it customized? So it just says pay with whatever I want. And, and, and your team was able to have that happen in a few days. So, um, you know, really innovative. Yeah. Obviously, we prefer to work with uh, companies that are, um, are close to us, although we'll work with global companies. Um, but yeah, um, really, really happy with uh, your, your team and, and, and certainly your presentation was great. A lot of great insights. Well, let me just, I want to, do I have time for one slide? More oh, slides? yeah, you do. And, and in fact, there's, but there's one, one question that Mila had mentioned, and I think I may have answered it, but yeah. she goes, she asked, uh, isn't there a flag with transactions greater than $10,000 with banks? And I said, yeah, FinTrack, FinRA. But, you know, in my experience, they'll just flag it, but I don't think they stop the transactions no. per no, se. No, 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 no. There is, what do you mean there's a flag? There is no banks involved in crypto transactions. That's the beauty of it. Yeah. Right? Oh, well, yeah. She, I think she's mentioned. Uh, yeah. Okay. Maybe she should uh, clarify. But uh, I agree with you. With crypto, you can't stop it. <laughs> no, that's the whole point, right? It's 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 good. To, well, you can, and there will be more and more regulation, by the way. And I welcome some regulation. Again, it's just like Lyft and Uber, because in the beginning it was just free for all, and and they were actually not competing on a fair basis in the airports and so on. We need rules, and then we will follow them, and we will, and it'll be adopted. But let me um. You know, jump to one. I also wanted to show you a demo. How you can? I don't know how many of you have ever paid on, online with uh, crypto, but anyway, maybe we don't have time for that. For years, but I yeah. Do, Me too. I do want to uh, mention a couple of things. Settlement guarantee. This is something that a lot of people ask us about. Well, but if I start accepting crypto, it goes up and down. Isn't that an issue? The answer is no. What we do is, if you're selling something for a hundred dollars, if you're charging for a, a service or whatever you do selling a house we actually have someone who wants to sell a house on um with crypto whatever you put up for sale if it's a hundred dollars or a thousand dollars or a million dollars you get a million dollars because that's what you, most people care about today most people do not want to settle in crypto they just want good old fiat dollars and so if you're selling a thousand dollar service and you don't really care what the shopper pays for they'll pay with crypto whether it's Bitcoin or something else, we guarantee you get $1,000 in the account next day, no matter what. And uh, so that's a very important point. We have a super easy, um, uh, what do you call it, um, user interface, and, and we can show you that. But really, this is what I wanted to cover today, um, Nathan. And if you think um, you yeah. want to, we can we can show one transaction if you want. I don't know how much time we have. Uh, yeah, we have time. And in fact, um, I was going to probably you know, have my presentation cut short just because of my issues with my laptop and, and, and phone. I mean, am I still echoing or am I echo? Is my echo gone? No, it's it gone to me. Okay, good. I have my headphones on. Um, we can do it. You can show a transaction. Uh, that'd be lovely. Absolutely. All right. So I don't know how many of in the audience has ever bought something online. We have a little demo store here. Anyone can do this. Nothing fancy. You can buy an NFT of Peter. I don't know how that can only be worth five bucks. I told the team it should be five million, but whatever. <laughs> yes. um, so here, what we're going to do is just going to buy um, an Amazon gift card. It doesn't really matter. You go into the cart. Again, this has nothing to do with us. Could be anything you buy online, right? And you're like, fine, this is fine. It's uh, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna then put some. It all already remembers me. Fine, I, I fill all this information up, and then I have my choice. Right? I can say I want to pay with the credit card with uh, crypto or with PayPal. So I'm just going to say pay with rocket fuel. 
And um, it's always dangerous to have the, the CEO um, demo it, but let's see if it, if it works. So uh, what I have here, and this is really our technology. Oh, we don't see the screen. See. I think you have to change your tab uh, there, Peter. Tab? Or, yeah, I don't know if it's, uh, you, for whatever reason, you're uh -huh. not, we're just seeing your um, slides still. Ah, you do. That's important. Uh, thanks for letting me know that. Yeah, no so, problem. Well, how do I do that? Um, maybe try you... try closing some of the tabs and then just keep the one with the, the screen open. Yeah. I mean, obviously keep your window with this open um, or, or, or try closing the sharing and then reshare. Uh, it says your screen sharing. Clo oh, okay. Close message. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me know if, you, if there's anything you can see here. Uh, still seeing the slides. You still see the slides. Ah, okay. I still see uh, existing oh. payment solutions um, with pink. Huh, that's interesting. Right. Um, oh, close yeah, video. Oh, yeah, whatever. and then try sharing again. Uh, allow. All this technology, huh? Yeah. <laughs> it says I'm sharing a screen now. Is it doing that or not really? Uh, it's, I might be. Oh, yeah, I think I see something now. Cryptocurrency transaction. What do you see? Uh, I it's on my phone, so it's a bit hard to see. Let me maximize this. What does it look like? Uh what does it look like? It's really tiny. What do you guys oh, see? I, 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 I see like just the window in the chat. So I think it's another tab you'd have to open up. Transaction. It worked out. Let's see here. Yeah, I, I'm not really used to this little. Um, yeah, it's a different so kind of way of doing anything. things. Yeah. Well, I mean, I wanted to show you how to do this. Uh, it's really fairly easy, so we don't have to necessarily do it. You can all go into rocketfuelblockchain.com, click on our yeah. store, and buy something on your own. Yeah. Um, and you know what? People could, you know, what we could do is, is Ubiquity could um, later on set up a small transaction that'll cost say a dollar or even like 50 cents yeah and then allow yeah. people to do it later um you know right now i guess a good use case uh, as a conversation goes on is oh i think you need to share every window open on your computer not just the actual screen that's what uh, george mm -hmm. said um but i was going to mention that you know ubiquity we have a full integration uh now set up um as it stands right now where if you go to ubiquity.io, that's ubiquity with a T, you know, uh, ubiquity.io slash listing, it'll take you and it'll allow people through our partnerships. We've actually partnered with a couple of different multiple listing services um, that allow people to now purchase homes using cryptocurrency. And now I will preface by saying that just books it. We go through the whole KYC AML process. We ensure that we have the right title partners that are in place. Um, we have some title partners in many jurisdictions who will help. And in fact, we have um, some folks who we're working towards this, but we, you know, our goals is with, uh, to be able to work with some underwriters as well to facilitate this. But generally, the title companies have their own underwriters and they, you know, we don't get a choice in it. Um, but we do things. Everything is pragmatically done, legally done, um, to the best of our knowledge. <laughs> Wes is probably cringing right now because he was our, our title attorney at one point. But our current legal counsel has said that we're doing everything right, um, so we're we're good in that front. And that's maybe yeah. that's a good point. That's a good yeah. point in the. Yeah. Like, oh, I'm I, sorry, I, I muted you by mistake. Could you repeat that sentence? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's important. This whole regulation is very, very complicated, only because things yeah. move so fast. But I'll say that uh, we are a publicly traded company, uh, which yeah. means we have to answer to the SEC every single quarter. I have to sign all sorts mm -hmm. of things and although it doesn't i mean everyone in this space whether it's also some of our competitors we're all small startups um but yeah. uh, smaller smallish but i mean what i always tell my customers and i know you and i have talked about it is mm -hmm. the fact that we're publicly traded and we have the sec looking at us every single quarter it yeah. i mean we can still make mistakes but we're spending a lot of time with lawyers and making sure everything is right um, so yeah absolutely and we're the same way you know, we work with folks, we, we lean on people on our team who are advisors who work in the real estate space, title companies, you know, our our part, uh, our, our infrastructure partners who are also our customers that reign your title, 
you know, their parent company is publicly traded. So they're under a lot of scrutiny and they want to do things right. And I'm like, you know, let's welcome that. Let's welcome smart regulation and let's work with the big insurance companies, the big title companies and small and, and medium to small ones. Um, yeah. You know, for us, <clears throat> you know, ubiquity when we first started, we made one mistake. And I, I can say that it's been long enough where the, you know, the industry will forgive me. But we used words like disrupt and disintermediate, and we realized those were big no-no words. Now we're just a prop tech company that works in cooperation with the existing industry because we are not going to stop large organizations like the NAR, the National Association of Realtors, who are one of the biggest lobbyists on K Street. You're not going to do that. What you have to do is say, I come in peace. Let's work all together and actually mean it and make it happen. And that's what we've done at Ubiquity. Yep. So. You know, one thing I should mention also, uh, and that'll answer one of the questions there about the 10K. Uh, one part of our, one use case and feature that we have in our product is an invoicing product. And what is really cool about that is even if you don't want to integrate our technology into your website, like I wanted to show you, but what we have some merchants that say, I just need to send an invoice for $18,000 mm -hmm. to a vendor and they want to pay with crypto. You know, we just log on to our system, you create the invoice, you send a link, and then um, the other end, and it really is great for cross-border, but it can work anywhere. They just click on the link, they pay with um, with crypto. And we had an example, and I like to mention that, we had a an art gallery call us up and said, look, I have a customer in the store, he wants to buy this $18,000 painting, real painting, not an NFT or anything, just a painting, but only if I can. It's good to clarify these days. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But only with if it, and to be like, yep, great. And in an hour, we set them up with an account. The store created the link. That person that was texted to the person's phone, he clicked on it and paid with $18,000 worth of uh, Bitcoin. Next day, the merchant had the US dollars in their account. Easy. There it's is not a limit for, um, for, for doing this because the banks are not involved. It doesn't go over the banks. And this is, by the way, yeah. why the banks are so much against crypto because who needs a bank account anymore? If you can have your digital dollar on your phone and you can pay and send it, who needs a bank account? Absolutely. Well, you know, they're going to make all their fees. Exactly. And it's a way of getting around it. I think that the best way to do it is you don't fight them, you replace them, and eventually they're going to have to merge in and adopt the technology. And Uber did. Exactly. Absolutely. And, and that's what Ubiquity is doing. You know, we're, we're not saying we're a payment provider. We like to lean on other technologies like, you know, Ubiquity is blockchain agnostic. Um, we are, you know, payment provider agnostic, although we've had the best uh, experience with Rocket Fuel, hence why you're on our webinar. Um, and and um, certainly your team has been just so hands on, so helpful. Everyone from the salespeople to the um, the IT people to the developers to up to the CEO um, has been a great experience. And, and for us, we're just excited because it's just really tying in um, to all of our other products too. So going into my speech and I, I'm not going to, you know, spend a lot of time cause I'm on my phone. I don't want to do share screen and it's going to probably, I'll probably break it. Um, you know, but uh, it is that, you know, we've we also have rocket fuel for our cloud solutions. So our unanimity, code base that we open sourced recently. It's an MIT license. Um, uh, we have have a hosted solution for enterprises, companies who want to have a parallel recording with their workflow that can tie it to their APIs and all that fancy stuff. Um, now we have a, a hosted solution and we're, we're taking rocket fuel for that, um, as well as some of our other consulting services, you know, taking rocket fuel, and of course, real estate too. So, you know, we're, we're happy partners, happy customers, um, and we, can't wait to be able to tie in other companies. Like, you know, for instance, we're working with some title companies. We're hoping to be able to get them on board because, uh, well, excuse me, they're already on board, but have some of their clients list their properties for a crypto listing service, which would be really cool. Uh, that's again, in, in the works, we're working with real estate firms. We have some large national agencies that are listing with us, but we just haven't announced it yet because it's still in pilot early pilot stages we just we actually just launched our crypto listing service literally two weeks ago um and and we listed some properties in, in toronto canada and in fact uh santiago as you mentioned earlier is happily going to get some properties listed from mexico too so we'll have canada us 
and Mexico um, to start. Now, one thing that Santiago had mentioned is uh, once the SEC lawsuits against Ripple ends, it will call uh, because it will one day, and uh, lots more clarity will come to the crypto securities markets. But always, innovators innovate always faster than the law. Yeah, and I would say in a lot of cases, you know, I mean, just speaking from Ubiquity's perspective, we're not publicly traded. We are registered. Uh, you know, we have Reg, Reg CF because we're doing equity crowdfunding through uh, WeFunder. We had to get the Reg CF and um, and all that, you know, in order to do things but you properly. Know what? So Remember, the issue with oh. the two phases of crypto, yeah. Yeah. The, there's the phase of, of, um, of crypto as an asset, as an investment. And that's what the Ripple thing is all about. What we're talking about is just using, we're just moving money from A to B, just like PayPal and all the others are doing. And there needs to be regulation on that. But um, I agree. It's just different. It's just different. Yeah, it is different. Absolutely. Um, Mila, I can't see all of Mila's message because it's cutting off my I phone here. Says, it. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. So bottom line is she's asking whether we are adding the gas fees to the transactions. And we are not. That's usually being charged directly to the um, the. The, the shopper uh, who is sending the money. So um, we we don't do that. That's good. Yeah, we, um you know, we're through our crypto listing service, uh, or excuse me, uh, non-fungible title platform, rather. That's Those are two new products that we launched, so I'm still getting <laughs> used to the nomenclature and the products. But the, the, the non-fungible title platform that uses NFTs or non-fungible records, that we call it, um, through one of our partners, is... Um, you know, we're we're using uh, Polygon, you know, a layer two um, protocol that works with Ethereum to batch, I guess it batches the the transactions to bring down costs, which is pretty cool. But um, so I, you're not adding gas. This, remember, no. this is one one point here that I, I, I said, but I, in five years or two years, yeah, maybe one year, depending on how big, quickly the U.S. government moves or the central bank, 99% of all crypto transactions are going to be the digital dollar. Why would people use Bitcoin or Ethereum or any of those with the volatility to pay for their groceries or for their car or for whatever? Mm -hmm. You don't want to deal with that. Just like people don't use Swiss francs or Japanese yen to pay for anything in the US because that would introduce volatility. People do, normal people don't want volatility. So, yeah. It's yeah. great that we have 15,000 currencies. It's going to get down to maybe five that are going to be big in five years. And the rest are going to use the, the digital euro, the digital dollar, the digital Chinese yuan, and the digital Indian rupee. Mm -hmm. Or I, I do think there's a big market, a free market push, where unless the regulations are done properly, again, this is my, only, my own personal views, not the views of Ubiquity or partners or anyone else. My own personal views as CEO Nathan Wozniak is that you're gonna have a lot of stable coins that will either be welcomed with open arms in the US and other large markets, or they'll simply exist outside those jurisdictions because there's still gonna be countries that are gonna say, you know what, to heck with these digital dollars that are not true stable coins in their eyes and perhaps in my eyes as a crypto anarchist type of minded person who understands regulations needed, but um, at the but same remember, time, the digital, you're gonna be pushed back on that too. Dollar, so. The digital dollar is is crypto. Yeah, CBDCs. That could be. I don't know. I don't know if I'd agree with that completely. Why is it not crypto? It's. I mean, crypto. All it is, it's a currency based on blockchain technology. That's it. It's just a more efficient way of doing it. And whether mm -hmm. it's called, and the only thing, the only difference with the U.S. dollar or USDTs. I mean, who would want to use USDT once there's a U.S. dollar, digital U.S. dollar? What's the purpose? None. Yeah, I mean, I think I have to learn a little bit more about Why? CBDTs, uh, DCs. Um, I think people don't want to, don't trust governments. Uh, I think they'd want a more free market approach that's run by companies rather than okay. regulated. You know but what? I, I'm just, I'll just tell you that um, a debate for another know, time. My, my mom and, and most people, <laughs> they are just going to be just fine with with uh, whatever currency. The oh, they would. Comes out with, they yeah, that and, yeah, yeah. They would. I mean, the, I mean, my mom, masses. my mom, for instance, my mom is my mom is in her seventies. She's not going to be caring or even knowing uh, the difference between uh, uh you know more private sector free market approach more government run 
crypto should just, in fact, when I was speaking at the National Association of Realtors event, I was on a panel with the deputy recorder of deeds for Cook County uh, and a gentleman, uh, Avi Spielman, who did his master thesis on blockchain and uh, real estate in 2016 at MIT Center for Real Estate. Uh, I said that it's going to be ubiquitous and the 500 realtors laughed and all of them didn't really understand anything about crypto or blockchain technology, but they did say, I said, it's going to be, uh, you know, it's going to be like the plumbing of the technology. You're not going to know you're using blockchain technology or crypto. And in fact, you open up a web browser. Are you sure you're, uh, as you're are you thinking about TCP IP protocols and packets and SYNAC and all that stuff? You know, acknowledgement packets went back. No, you don't care. You don't know. You don't want to know. That's exactly how blockchain technology is going to be and is starting to go, in my view. Yeah. And, and it's not going to take 20 years for it to happen. And that's why I like, I like your perspective, Peter. You, you're, you, I like when you say one to two years because I am as optimistic as you are. that This is going to make a big difference in the market. Yeah. But I think what's going to happen, so that's on the payment space, but I, also because yeah. it started. But I think we will see, like we did with the internet, over, uh, 10 years later, after the internet came out. That's when we had um, Facebook and these guys, right? I mean, they just figured well, that out. The World out. Wide Web, for sure. Social yeah. thing. And Twitter yeah. and all of that. So I think over the next 10 to 20 years, there are so many inefficient processes today in the world, in, in real estate, in supply chain management, what have you, and they can be, mm -hmm. it's just a new technology. Yeah, social networks. I mean, even people not being able to own their own data. Uh, there needs to be revolutions yeah. there with Web Web three. I like to call it Web three because Web three covers you know VR, AR, more than just blockchain technology and cryptocurrency payments. But yeah, you know certainly Web three point oh is uh, going to make a big difference. Oh, ease of use. I don't know about that, Mila. Uh, I think that there's a lot a lot of people who are caring about their autonomy online and and who owns their data. Uh, you know, I would I would say that that's it's. It's ease well, of how use. Does that, how does that explain? How does that explain two point five billion users on Facebook? They care, and then they don't because they do want to follow it. Yeah, I mean, people leave Facebook. I left. For, I left Facebook for almost two years, and I, thought, I was like, "Oh, I miss my friends," <laughs> and came back. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's but, my uh, point, right? That people care about privacy until they want to buy something, and then or read it. Yeah. But well, I think, it, but people it, want it to have control. They want to have some control over their data. Uh, and that's why I think a lot of these platforms are starting to lean on uh, configurations and, and features to allow them to share data, you know, as, as they need it. I think it just comes down to usability and giving people a choice. Uh, some people are just going to ignore it and they're going to enable everything and not even know or care. But there are people out there. Um, I think there's a tie that's yeah. turning where people are starting to care more about this kind of stuff. But uh, yeah, but anyway, I, I probably cut it short. Um, I've kind of already talked about, you know, what our use case with uh, Rocket Fuel would be. You know, um, people can learn more about Ubiquity at uh, ubiquity.io. We have ubiquitypay.com. Uh, we're, uh, we're a payment agnostic provider. And uh, I also recommend people check out crypto list, our crypto listing service, which is ubiquity.io slash listing and i'll list the urls later on uh once this is recording is done and, and those who want to learn, learn about our crypto um excuse me our non-fungible title platform which uses non-fungible title uh non -fun uh, nft technology uh they can learn at, at ubiquity.io slash nft uh but uh people can learn about your company at, at your website address is rocketfuelblockchain.com is that correct peter correct beautiful and uh anyone else uh everyone uh, of course meet and greet, uh, continue to chat on the, on, on there. Uh, this chat is open forever, uh, so we can always go back to it. Um, we'll have future webinars uh, and certainly catch up on these conversations. I think it'd be good to have a debate actually regarding CBDCs and uh, any of this technology because things are changing very rapidly. But um, on that note, thank you for everyone. Just for make one comment on that. Please. I want to make one comment on that. All right. The, the reason I feel so strongly it's going to happen here is mm -hmm. that China has done it. And uh, yeah, I am pretty sure that the reason China did it, they did it for two reasons. They want, so remember, 
our monetary system is part of our infrastructure, just like airports and roads. And the more efficient your system is, you're, the more competitive you're going to be. We all know that. And um, but that's one thing. But you know, I think the bigger goal for China is to replace the U.S. dollar as the dominant um, currency in the world. And now that they're going to become the biggest economy in the world, I I would think that they would like to do that, and they're going to use technology for that like they've done so many with so many other things and that's why they're doing it and that's why i think the u.s government and central bank has to respond to that thinking that yeah. this is not going to happen it's just crazy but oh it's, it's gonna happen well they'll, they'll, they'll follow they'll follow suit for sure and and i mean i just hope that we don't follow some kind of a social credit score like china is doing that's my personal issue with that but they're, yeah. they're probably mm-hmm. correlated but again for another time <laughs> um everyone Thank you so much, Peter. A pleasure. I hope we can we help you back as a, a speaker again, okay? Yeah, anytime. Absolutely. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. And uh, you can just tune into the recording by simply going to the same URL address. So I'm going to do my best to... Yeah, thank you, Peter. I'm going to do my best to end this recording. And I, hopefully I can <laughs> figure this out at some point because I'm using my mobile phone. Uh, bear with me, everybody.